Welcome everyone to the afternoon session. Uh, the first speaker is Eric Freeman. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So honored and delighted to be invited here to celebrate Dan's birthday. I don't know when your birthday is, Dan, but happy birthday. Well, Dan and I were colleagues for three years, and that's remarkable because we managed not four years, oh, four <laughs> years. It's a three year NSF post op, wasn't it? There was four months, and we managed not to collaborate. And I've always felt that I've but uh, I've we've been in touch all these years, and I've admired great things that Dan has done. And the schools that he's developed and all the people here are a tribute to uh, the energy and influence Dan has had. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about something completely different in the sense. I've been thinking about this for 10 years, but I've given very few talks. And the work I'm talking about, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody. So it could be all wrong. Morning. So I'm going to talk about uh, representations of groups like the Pennsylvania. And um, the category of G modules for a linear algebraic group, it's a very nice abelian category with enough to check. So it's tempting to treat it like category five groups. There are a couple of wrinkles, though. One of them is a reductive group, well, let's say semi simple, sim simply connected groups, has no non trivial formal. Moreover, um, almost all these reductive linear algebraic groups have no projective modules except for zero. So, certainly, you don't have the beta category, and you don't have fine with many irreducible. So, it's a somewhat different world. So I've been playing around with this, and there are very concrete questions, so I'll concentrate on them. And I'm not persuaded anyone else to think about it. It says something. So we'll see whether someone here can actually say something even on the fly. Okay. So this arrow key is supposed to do something. It doesn't. What do I do? Can we click again? Or click. All right. Oh. Oh, so it's now focused on the slide. Okay. Nope, it didn't. You might have moved in your microphone and it's supposed to have to allow it. Maybe I should. Yeah, I'm a colleague. Yeah, I'm a colleague. Sorry. Yeah, so now that's why it's worth it. Okay, let's try this. Doesn't work. Wait, what? Do I click first? No, oh, no, no. You just use left and right from now on. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here is a, a brief outline. Um, I, this talk could take 15 minutes, but it's more likely to take two hours. So we'll see. Julia can tell you about one embarrassing situation I've had of going over. But what, just briefly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about uh, basically support theory for finite group schemes. This is not new, but it motivates the context of what I want to do for algebraic groups. So my notation is boldface math blackboard bold G is a linear algebraic group. I'll define them. And then I want to talk about um, a new way to look at the representations of these algebraic groups, which supplements ways I've done uh, in papers over the last few years. And that's by restricting the uh, hop algebra to sub co -algebras. And that'll enable me to describe certain classes of linear representations of the groups, which are quite interesting. And I'm particularly fascinated by uh, what, are, what I call mock injective modules. I don't understand it all. Um, an injective module is mock injective. And the best result I know is a result of Kardeski, uh, Arnakan, and Sabaja, which I'll come to. 
but that'll lead to uh, some sort of stable model, module category structure. So we have various challenges to work with these linear algebra groups and the challenges to identify modules about which you can say something like growth. Some of these modules are very, very big, so it's anything is that big. But the only real interest, as I'll explain, is in infinite dimensional modules because otherwise, Restricting the finite group schemes is a reasonably appropriate thing to do. So I'll try and move quickly through this so-called review. A linear algebraic group is, um, I'll give some examples in just a moment, but for me, it's going to be, it's coordinate algebra is not a fine dimensional algebra over a field. My field doesn't have to be algebraically closed, but it certainly has to be characteristic feet. It's going to, the coordinate algebra is going to be a domain. And I, for simplicity, I want to assume that it's uh, smooth. So it's, G is a smooth affine variety of this field. And then a representation of G, in some sense, is an, is an algebraic way of G acting on vector spaces of K. So it's really physics, just G acting on K. But the formal way to design the uh, to define this is is that our representations are co-algebras for the uh, coordinate algebra view that's a pop algebra. So it has a uh, co-algebra structure, and the vector space has to be a co-module for that co-algebra structure. And that just for this basically it says that the um, coefficients of the representation have to vary uh, algebraically. So not all representations of G, if you looked at the, let's say K were algebraic and closed, if you looked at the K points of G as a discrete group, not all those representations would be what I call G models. These have to be algebraic. Now, the way I like to think of a, a representation of an algebraic group, like this linear algebraic group, is it simply a functorial way of acting on vector spaces? And what does functorial mean? It means that you go from K to any, uh, let's say, finally generated commutative um, algebra over K, call it A, and then you look at the A points of G, they act on D tensor A in a functorial way. So that's, that's actually. It's going to be much less categorical than the previous talks, but that categorical way of thinking about what a G module is is a good way to think. So, if you have a, a one of these linear algebra groups, these big groups, with a coordinate algebra, just some um, domain, it has, will have finite subgroups. Now, by finite subgroups, one thing we can do is um, we can say that if formally, if uh, somehow we can look at the FQ points of the group, right? We have to have the group to be defined over FQ before we can look at FQ points. FQ means Q is a power of P. So then that's a finite group. And we can have the finite group acting on that vector space. As I mentioned parenthetically to those technically inclined, we usually take K large, but then we say things are defined over FQ, including the action. And what comes up in this study is the Frobenius. So Frobenius is a, something that's a non-non only in characteristic P algebraic geometry. And what you do is you take the variables and raise them to the power. Now the Frobenius map uh, for G isn't always a map from G to G. But if you look at the rth power of Frobenius, there is. The group G is defined over P to the R, I would say it's defined over P. So then it's actually endomorphism. And we'll just, I'll usually drop the twist and just think of the Frobenius as an endomorphism. But we can define the end, we can define this Frobenius map no matter what the field K is. It doesn't have to be a finite field or a logical closure. So then associate this Frobenius map, it comes in because we can look at the kernel of this Frobenius map. And the kernel of this Frobenius map is both, if we, as we vary R, higher powers of Frobenius, the big, how high 
higher values of R, we get the R Thevanius kernels with various R. These are finite uh, subgroup schemes of G. And the way uh, I have looked at uh, representations in the past is by taking a representation of both phase G and restrict it to these finite subgroup schemes. And it's also interesting to take representations, which we often do, and restrict it to the finite subgroups G of FQ. Now, these are different gadgets. G of FQ as an algebraic variety is a discrete uh, variety with Q points. Um, G of R as an algebraic variety, it's a scheme. It's a scheme with only one point with a lot of infinitesimal points. In any event, the representation theories of G of FQ and G of R have some similarities. We've exploited, exploited that over the years looking at finite group schemes. And finite group schemes inform the representation of G to some extent. And when I started thinking about this, I think I was, I thought that the goal of everything was to look at linear algebraic groups, not things like these finite gadgets. Each of these, either both G sub R and um, G F Q, they're coordinate algebra, or they're dual algebra, they're Hopf algebras, they're finite dimensional Hopf algebras. But somehow, um, it's still very interesting and challenging to look at the big group G, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'll go through this quickly. Um, slides are available. Um, the first example is the additive group. And the additive group as a functor it takes a community of K over A and takes A as an integer group. So it's a functor in each community of K over and take the underlying group. And Okay, you can be much more concrete. In this case, the coordinate algebra of this pop algebra, G is A, is just uh, polynomials in one zero K of C. And the, the co module structure, it's delta V for a particular vector space V, goes from V to V tensor K of T. Now, it's I don't like to say it's hopeless, but it's certainly a very, very wild problem to classify added representations of the additive group. Much more complicated than just representations of an elementary theory D group of arbitrarily large rank. So what's involved in representations are um, infinitely for just simply the additive group, infinitely many P unipotent operators. That commute, but they have another condition on them. You just don't take them independently. There's an integration condition. So it's a just even for this additive group, it's really fairly uh, more than fairly complicated. And I don't really understand, even in the additive group case, what's going on. This is, well, I understand some things more than for any other group. There's still a lot to compute. Yes. Yes. Uh, a C's. Uh, yes, there's. Um, I don't know how to use. Oh, I do know how to use it. That C is actually an A, or that A is actually a C. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Count the typos. So the general linear group is another familiar uh, linear algebraic group. And it's uh, invertible n by n matrices. By the way, which what's even a nicer uh, algebraic model is n by n matrices multiplication. There's no inverse. So the coordinate ring of the monoid is just polynomial variables in n squared variables. It's a polynomial ring in n squared variables, but there's no antipode. But for the general linear group, we do have an antipode associated in the coordinate. Associated to the inverse that we consist of by the general linear. And it's quite challenging, done in some small cases, of saying uh, what representations look like. We're interested in keeping the dimensional ones. But anyway, there's a defining representation, just n dimensional challenge. So here are a few of the um, 
basic, there's the word infinitesimal that is written so small, I can't see it. Some basic infinitesimal dimensional, infinite dimensional representations of linear operations. So there's the regular representation. You can let the group act on the functions. It's a very interesting standard representation. You can let it act on the right. And then the if you let it act on the right, then the co-action structure is just the uh, co-product of of all g or the four dimensions. And you can let it act on the left. It's not much different. And it turns out that those two representations are isomorphic as representations, but different. You can let it act on functions by conjugation. And then another natural infinite dimensional gadget would be uh, the universal envelopment. You know, the group both as G act by conjugation in the literature. We'll see many other representations. Okay, so it would be nice to have a, a good support theory with G, whatever that means, a good geometric way, it's for me, a geometric way of somehow categorizing aspects of the representations of this big G. And we do have a quite nice theory for these infinitesimal uh, group schemes, G sub R, these pervenous kernels. And we do have for the finite groups, G of F. And um, I, there's a way to, this is a, this is a suggestion of Julius to take, just take the in dot, take the uh, colon as R increases to the support varieties of the infinitesimal group schemes. That turns out to be what I was doing with um, uh, one parameter subgroups. So these pi groups are really good for some theoretical but they're very difficult to get explicit actions. But in any event, it agrees with uh, earlier construction with uh, one parameter subgroups, which are maps of linear algebraic groups from GA to G. One way or another, support theory gives you associated to a, a G module a subspace of some global space. In this case, it's Pi of G, it's just called Pi. That's the global space, and inside there is subspace of Pi sub M. Now it's distressing. Okay. M is a G module. So for each M, for each G module, you have a support of the G module. So what is Pi G M now? Pi G M is a is a well let's fix on r this was supposed to be a review for that any particular r you have pi g sub r and if you want that's associated with the cohomology of this finite group scheme and then pi g sub r sub m is associated to whatever module you take and you take a subspace of that that's the support that's the that's the invariant associated to the module inside the um Full support space. So this is actually quite a nice invariant. Of, we'll see. I'll have a slide with some properties. Of it. It's a nice invariant of modules. These M, whether they're G modules or you could start with taking G sub R modules. But what Andre Susan visited me uh, in Los Angeles some years ago, and we spent a week trying to prove that the following non-fact it's false that if you if you take this support variety for m and if it's empty then m is an injective model so that's a detection of injective and subjective and we just spun our wheels and we never proved it and then sort of accidentally i saw out of the paper um client partial scott you could you could easily construct what I call mock injectives, which are not injective, but they have empty support. So what group? For basically any group. I guess in uh, 
you need something like uh, for G, you need that uh, it's probably sufficient for P dividing the group of connected components or something. Is that right? So basically, even for semi-simple, yeah, for semi-simple, but they but they exist for GA. They exist for unicode. Yeah. They're basically what it's there. So this is really terrible negative news, but it's actually really good news because it means there's something interesting. There's something more about these uh, big groups, which is coordinate algebras, or um, domains, than just approximating by finite groups. And that's what we're talking about. So let me tell you, before I launch into what you do to uh, find detect more than you can just detect from infinitesimal groups. The support theory that was developed for um, G that I developed um, using this uh, limiting pi pointer, one parameter subgroups. Uh, what I did was construct a stable module category, even though we don't have a propaneous structure, we don't have projectors or injectors. Um, and there's, there's the definition. And the definition is sort of strange in that I divide out by the uh, thick subcategory of mock injected modules. So these mock injected modules are the they're the thing that makes it um, different from just looking at something uh, coming from infinitesimal subgroups, coming from uh, finite dimensional operators. And um, I look at a stable, the stable module category arises from, well, you need a triangulated category and we don't have triangles in the module category because we don't have a Frobenius category. So you, you look at chain complex, co-chain complexes, you do something with it, like extend some result with uh, Jeremy Rico. And then this support theory is really nice. It doesn't seem um, mock injectors, but it's actually quite nice. So now, it's, I'm talking about pi g sub c dot rather than m because I'm looking at chain co-chain complexes of modules. So that's what c dot is. I'm actually interested in the modules, not necessarily chain complexes, but I'm forced, meaning if I want to really work with triangular categories, it's more general the module category embeds in this to look at chain complexes. So if you mind what is the notation here, pi g c dot? Yes, so this is the, I define a support theory, I associate, go back, and, I associated each G module, I have some subspace in this pi G. Okay, now I generalize that not just to, it's not so hard, not just to modules, but to bounded complexes of modules. And that's what this is. It's the generalization of the module to the complex. The full complex, you would not change the or you go for the homology. Did you say that really? You look at the No, I look at the complex. At the complex. Complex. So, um, so a very nice thing is that this support is empty if and only if uh, C dot is zero in my uh, stable module category. But in particular, that ignores mock injectors. And it behaves, it behaves well under tensor product. It oh, has the two out of three properties. So it's got a lot of properties that you like to be able to detect something. This if and only if it says it's detecting quite a bit. You'd like it to detect something and behave well with respect to short exact sequences and tensor product, it's implicit in sums, but it's still missing something essential. And I just comment, the last review comment is that this construction I had a few years ago, looking at this limiting thing of, for, from the finite dimensional um, subgroup schemes inside G, you do get a stratification theorem uh, following. I think this one is a ripoff of BIKP. Reformulated in a different context, but uh, it 
fundamental theorem goes back to Benson, um, um, Krause, um, that's over. But, so we're in fairly good shape, except that it doesn't see these mock injections. In fact, it does, the, the support writing does pretty well with finite dimensional markets. You can quantify that by the means. But instead, I want to say, I'm going to try a completely different approach rather than restricting to subgroups or subgroup schemes. So this completely different approach is a G module is a co-module for the coordinate module. So what that means is you have some vector space and you have this co-action. You go from V to B tensor to co-action. So I want to restrict that co-action. So I want to look at the co-action so that it lands in X inside O of G. So that's what this is. These are X co-modules. So the category of X co-modules is an abelian subcategory, or abelian subcategory of the category of G modules. Um, here I say it has a, there's a very nice uh, left exact right adjoint. So given a G module, I can associate to it an X co-module, and it's really easy to do. It takes a little proving, but the X co-module of a given G module, maybe a huge one, is I look at the biggest sub-module of M, start with M, I look at the biggest sub-module of M whose co-action lands in X. And that turns out to be well-defined and it looks uh, left exact, and it's right adjoint to the inclusion point. <laughs> Sorry? Mod GXI. Yeah. Is it evident that it is enough? Yes, yes. It is because if you take an injector G mod, mod G has enough injectors. And if you restrict, yeah, if you apply this functor to this, whatever you call it, sub X to an injector, you get an injector. So it gives you enough injectors. So the interesting thing is. For every module M, this gives me a filtration where the first stage of the filtration or the co actions only lands in X mod second in X1, and it's an exhausting filtration. It's a very interesting filtration. And what was interesting about it, and why I got interested in this in the first place, it detects injectivity. A module is inject, it's an injective. In G module, if and only if it's an injective MXI module for any sequence of XIs that exhaust O of G. Just so in the 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 it, yes. Yeah, every element is in it. Yeah. So one does better than that. Instead of just taking these subspaces inside the coordinate algebra, it's Turns out to be much more useful to look at sub co -algebras. In fact, I look at finite dimensional sub co inside the coordinate. So, for example, in K of T, what I'd be looking at is K of T with degree less than or equal to some given number, less than or equal to N. That's a sub co -algebra. So, I'm filling up the coordinate algebra with sub co And um, if you look at Instead of a general X, you look at uh, an X, which is a co-algebra, then the modules for the co-algebra are exactly co-modules for that C. So it's a very natural thing to do. And all, another nice property is if you look at a, uh, uh, a G module, the M sub C, X taking X equal to C, is precisely all the elements in M whose co-action land in M tensor C. It's not always true for X. And now, what's nice is it's a fundamental theorem of pop algebra, basically. For any finite dimensional subspace, you can find a finite dimensional sub co algebra containing that subspace. So if you have an increasing sequence of finite dimensional subspaces, you can find an increasing sequence of finite dimensional sub co algebras. Well, I don't actually use this, I use a different increasing sequence of sub co algebras. I first 
looking at the gradation on n by n matrices that induces a filtration on uh, the coordinate algebra GLN, which is uh, polynomials and n squared variables with determined grid. There's a natural, filter, nice filtration in that. And then I, any linear algebra group emits some embedding into GLN, and I fix an embedding. If I have a, some computation, how much it varies on the embedding. Fix an embedding G into GLN, and then I let it inherit this filtration of GLN, because for this filtration, I can do some computations. So, some course you could argue it comes from some distinct infinity quotient of the group G. No, no. Um, pardon? Just think of the simplest examples. Look at K bracket C. Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah. Where, where you know, the directions are all wrong. On the other hand, I'd love to know something about cohomology of these things. Just for example, whether it's finally generated or, you know, the, these sub co are real mysteries. But I can say you know, there's so much open about this. Okay, so here's some relations between what used to be taking a module and restricting it to a finite. Uh, to a Frobenius kernel, which is a finite subgroup scheme, and taking a module and doing this restriction on the coaction. So the, I used to call M sub X for given X inside the coordinate algorithm. Then I called it M sub C when the X was a, a co-algebra. And now I'm calling it sub D because it's coming from this special type of um, coming from this um, total degree and general linear group restricted down to my G. So I'm just using the letter D and remembering the embedding into a, uh, a GL. So there are nice adjoint functors comparing co-modules for this sub co-algebra, presumably, well it is, finite dimensional sub co-algebra, and modules for the uh, Finite group scheme. So we're finite on both sides. Remember the sub co algebras detect injectivity, which is what was missing for the sub group schemes. So I'm looking at these sub co algebras, I'm looking at modules for them, and I know they have to be some good because they detect uh, at least uh, whether or not something is a more conjecture. So here's the adjunction business and the exactness. And not only that, if I, if I fix a D and then pick R large, then I see that the co-modules for this O sub D that's restricting the co-action by D embed as a full D and sub in the um, modules for the uh, R infinitesimal curve. So it's sort of interesting, a completely different perspective of looking at subgroup schemes versus looking at sub co algebras and I'm doing finite subgroup schemes and finite sub co -algebras. And I just point out that one difference is that um, you see um, a, a, a G module is a mock injective if and only if it restricts to injective in every subgroup scheme, whereas a G module is injective if and only if it restricts to injective uh, mo module for these sub So, it's possible that we get Yes, but um, but, not, but not not so much. They're proportional somehow. Yeah. yeah, it's easy to see the proportion right. if you use this like you, you could use a really crazy different yeah. embedding, and then it could go way wide, back, especially in terms of computations. Okay, so here's the first family of modules that I thought would be. Uh, sensible to look at, I call them cofinite modules. And it's a really simple definition. A module is cofinite. Remember, we're looking at a big group and we're looking at huge modules, at least infinitesimal modules. And I say it's cofinite if it is, if it's restriction M sub X is finite dimensional for every finite dimensional subspace X inside OG. So that in particular, because you can exhaust by uh, 
a countable sequence that says the module has to be countable. So it's, these aren't particularly large modules, but they're large. Basically, all the modules I've looked at is cofunct modules. Okay, so this is it's equivalent to saying that you can find some sequence of XIs. So the M XI is finite dimensional for each XI, or that you can find some sequence of finite dimensional sub co algebras so that the, the co modules are finite dimensional. So this is a relatively nice category. It has almost all the properties you want to just go to town, but it lacks one basic property. So it has submodules, it has extensions, it takes you know, um, direct sum ends. Um, it, uh, a finite dimensional guide embeds in a cofinite injective. Um, it has nice tensor product, but what it doesn't have is quotients. I can take a cofinite module and divide out by another cofinite module and get something that's not quotient. So that's slightly disturbing. So otherwise, so it's not an abusing category, but it's a nice category. And it's, a, it's an interesting class of modules to consider. G modules, such that when you restrict to finite dimensional subspaces of the coordinate algebra, and you're viewing the coordinate algebra, you're only using its, you're viewing it's a big co-algebra. You restrict to finite dimensional subspaces, you get these MXs of the Okay, so sure. Yes. So you are saying that any submodule is H for finite? Yes. No, it's a particular case, yes. But it's just it's a repeat. It's also probably a particular case of two. Yes. Okay. And the last property is that the module is pretty interesting to explain because you're yeah, saying the restriction to the restriction is not exact or the one. Yeah, it's left exact. Oh. That, it, the fact that it's not exact doesn't imply that this would happen. But it, if it were exact, it wouldn't happen. Okay, so once we have this cofinite guys, then we can talk about growth. And this is, the, I think there's probably more, many ways to measure growth, but this is the way I measured it. Um, so what should be the co what should be the growth of one of these infinite dimensional modules for one of these uh, linear algebraic groups? So I'd say, just look at the dimensions when you restrict to these um, sub co-algebras indexed by D, you know? That's not the dimension of co-algebras, indexed by D, coming basically from, uh, finally from N by N matrices and total degree D, so it's a degree of an action, and divide by D to D. And then if that limit is a positive number, then I say it has exponential growth E with leading coefficient C. And those are my two invariants. So I have two invariants in my home. In a hand, I can look at other coefficients, but I, I haven't been the same. Thing. So, uh, I didn't say this, but if I took a different embedding of my group G, that would not change the E, the growth, the, the polynomial growth. That polynomial growth is independent of the embedding. The coefficient is overwhelmingly dependent on the embedding. But I've, I've done various computations of um, cofinite modules. Just one example, I say here, you look at a homogeneous space and the growth is equal to what you would expect. I'll come, I'll come to a more elaborate computation soon. There it is probably, but I haven't looked at it. Yeah, yeah there, there's so much, yes. Yes. Well, homological, I'm not sure, something. Yes. So here are some properties of mock injective modules, and none of these properties are valid for uh, injective modules. 
Small conjecture, they can only have the support variety uh, empty. A co-limit of mock injective varieties is not. If you have a short exact sequence, then it says if two of them are mock injective, the third is mock injective. If you have a, a closed embedding of linear algebraic groups and uh, you take a mock injective G module and restrict it to H, you don't necessarily get an injective H module, but you get a mock injective. These mock injectives are really a nice class of injective measures. They, they started out as ghosts, but they're, first of all, they started out as conjecturally non-existent. Then they started out as uh, sort of quarks or something, but now I'm just seeing them all over the place. So here's an interesting property I proved, and I'm really suspicious of that, so I've gone back and forth over it several times. There are no non-zero homomorphisms from a mock injective to a uh, finite dimensional module. Or more generally, I didn't say this, that if a module is finite dimensional, then its co-action has to land in some finite dimensional subspace X. So every finite dimensional module is M is equal to MX for big matrix. So this is more general than saying for finite dimensional. So mock injectors don't seem to have any um, maps except the zero map. To a finite dimension, including injective maps. Remember, it just seems maybe it's wrong. Now, there's some conditions on the group here. Why do you need two bigger than two times two? I'm using the liftability of um, um, whatever um, injective holes of, of infinitesimals up to uh, G. So, you lower bounds to times two. Okay, you can subtract it. <laughs> I would have thought the tall and far. That's where it comes from. <laughs> maybe this is a way to prove uh, something that doesn't make sense. This may be true in complete generality. It, well, no, it's not true for G. I mean, it's not. But in any event, it just it seems remarkable to me. You say it's not true for GLA. No, GM. Or a torus. Yeah. So I guess it's not true for yeah for G in GL, but it's yeah. true for SO or something. So here's this uh, theorem that I'm going to use from um, Will, Dan, and Paul's uh, paper. They saw a three friends of mine um, where I introduced mock injectors, and they immediately produce this really beautiful paper and publish it long before my treatment, um, showing how to construct certain mock injectors. And it's something I would have never thought. What they do is induce up from the finite group to the big group. Now, there's a history of that, a Nakano history of doing this, but it would, it's certainly outside of my history to take, uh, in, do induction from a tiny little group all the way up to the big one. So in this case, what you do is you take a G module, you restrict it down to G FQ, and then you induce it back up. Now that's a ridiculous thing to do. But you do that and you get a mock check. Now I remind you, and I have to, I'm reminding you because I have to remind myself of this. When you take a G module and restrict it to a subgroup H, you're not changing the vector. You're not, it's not getting any bigger or smaller. You start out with, which is fine. You start out with a finite dimensional, that's what often you start out with a finite dimensional G. So you restrict it down, you just look at the H action. H in this case is G of H. But then you induce it up and you probably get something very good. Okay. And um, and that's a mock injective uh, G module. Moreover, uh, they give criteria when that's, um, not only a mock injective, but it is not injective. I, I don't know if it's, I think it's their term, call it a proper mock injective, if it's mock injective but not injective. So we obviously mentioned those mock injectives which aren't actually injective, but it's very nice to look at the whole case. Okay, so that's a construction. It's a really nice construction. It's not the construction. Not the construction. 
So, um, so here's very briefly an example just for the additive group, GA. You get these mock injectors. This, this is something um, Andre Sisman and I tried to do by hand. Construct something that construct something that was looked injected for every infinitesimal subgroup scheme of the additive group of this number. And what you do is you you look at the invariance under G A F Q F P if you want. G K of G A is just K bracket T. So it's very concrete in this case. And I had some recently some thoughts about how you understand these induced modules, and it's in terms of a Lang in algebraic geometry, which I used in homotopy theory long, long ago. It's either one over Frobenius, identity over Frobenius, or Frobenius over um, the identity. And you look at the image of that map, and uh, you're going to see. I hope to give you some intuition about what these markings are. There's one interesting phenomenon that if you start out, which is what they do, if you start out with the G module, let's go back again, you're sticked it down to H, and then you loose it up to G. You're not doing a heck of a lot in some sense. What you're doing is taking the G module just as a vector space and tensoring it with what you get as a G module when you induce up. The trivial module. So inducing up from the trivial module is all important. Yup. So you're thinking H to G K that the market is in H. Yup. But there's no H on the right hand side. Oh uh, H is G F Q. That's what I was sorry. Oh okay. Yo. H is G F Q. H is G F Q. Yeah. So, okay. So, just a, some idea. Where does cofinite type come? Well, I computed the induced module for UN, M by N, unipotent upper triangular matrices, induced from um, UNFQ up to UN. Okay. Now, K is a, a UN module, obviously. So I don't have to do any restriction, I do so. And here is its cofinite type. So that's, this tells you the growth. That was the E, the growth is where, wherever it is. I tell you what N prime is. It's something like N times N minus one, there it is. N prime is N squared minus N minus two. And then the uh, leading coefficient is M, that's the dimension of M over this enormous number. Now, this enormous number, I show you this for one reason. This shows you how sparse this is. This sits inside K of um, the coordinate algebra of UN. It sits inside there, but it sits inside there very sparse. So it's really, these mock injectors are very sparse. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, I've done some sort of categorification of um, this business of um, what we've seen before. And I have functors now from the state ST mod, this gadget is a full subcategory of the category of the stable module category for H modules. H in this case is GFQ. So it's a full subcategory whose objects are have a lift to G. And it goes to the um, stable category of mock injectors, which I'm detecting fine. But I take um, mock injectors, and that's an exact category. I divide them by injectors. And so this gives me in a, a categorical um, category map, which on K theory, this is what's called categorification. You, you go to the groups, and this is an injective map. So let me just end with a few of my many questions about this. If I could persuade some smart people or even dumb people, or even people who are gonna be alive in a year to work on this, I'd love to, I mean, there are all sorts of questions. First of all, I don't know how to get a geometric, this is what I'd like, is some sort of 
space that would also detect Mark injections. So, um, I'd like to know something about these finite dimensional sub coefficients. I'd really like to know something about their core. What I, I spent a lot of effort trying to compute the rational cohomology of the Heisenberg group, U3. That's the rational group. And I still don't know. So um, let's see. I guess it's uh, Susan Friedlander Bendel papers give you this. They give you stuff up to nil potents, and I know a lot about the nil potents, but I still can't compute everything. And I would like to use these sub coefficients to at least compute that case. There are all sorts of questions about cohomology that may be restricting the sub coefficients. I'd like to know a lot more ways to construct uh, mock injectors. I got them originally by restricting injectors down to subgroups rather than reducing them. I'd like to understand, not just for mock injectors, but in general, how weird is this category of G modules, even if you're restricting to co -finding. I think you should, things go really crazy if you let the dimension go large, but co seems like a nice class to start with. And then here's a question, possibly is implicit in this HNS paper. I mean, is it true? Possibly it's true that a mock injective is actually injective if it's injective and it's restricted to every finite subgroup, GFT. And maybe that would be a, that's a way to measure injectivity. You can restrict to infinitesimal subgroup schemes and finite subgroups in this so once again, happy birthday, Dan. And um, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Are there any questions or answers? Yes. No answer about the factory. So you said it's factory or factory. How about the T8? Do you know that it's T8? Mm -hmm. Well, it's anything to it. G sub A. G sub A. Oh, G sub A. No, I know. Well, yeah, that turns out. Yeah, I mean, the, you can, the whole market is certainly done with it. It's inclined quite to the top of the space back. Mm -hmm. And, but what's G A is very special because these sub co algorithms, some of them that isomorphic onto the, uh, Co algebra of the Corbanius one. So there's a splitting co algebra. So it's a GA is very special. So I know much more about GA. But um, yeah, uh, the next thing would be to try SL2. <laughs> <laughs> what I do, well, what would make with profile group is you, you, you really, you really, by definition, you're thinking about all those.
No, I don't think so. I mean, you can have actions you know, just for GA. You have infinitely many operators. You can have an infinitely many operators as an autonomous What's the difference? Scope, well, that's an example of autonomous. But you don't have a, the co action is not cool. Can you separate from the Yes, I'm just going to use that word, but that's what we And so, the category of generate the whole category of. I mean, you never thought about that. No, I don't know. I think you, they probably do. But no. Right. <laughs> but you can all that transparency without me. Exactly. Yes. I have to keep them on the call. I mean, I can't think on my feet, but the answer is probably yes. They must be. I mean, every. Well, can it, I told you there are no maps on a mark and jet with the mark and jet. But every module, every G module, is a colon of time to use. So, in that sense, so that says, I guess, yes. Yeah. No. But that's not interesting. So, it makes me think. But everything that, that's just about how that everything is about coding. So, it's not interesting to never find a dynamic correct. No. No matter what. It's bigger than it can't be. It could be. There's very definitely two people. Yeah, that's one more question. I'll take him from the many This uh, category mark uh, GC, the yeah. algebra. Yeah. Have you tried to see what is the like go module of that category? Like, take this that closing category by a mod G with mod GC and try to get the mark injectors in my. Yeah, I'm not sure what the target category will be at this point. It's that closing maybe and. Never found me. So I, I'm just that might be very interesting. Um, I don't know that you know, I, you know, I don't know. It, it might be an obvious, I'm an obvious candidate, but I don't know. Yeah, because it's related to like not GR or something like that. Yeah. Then it would what do you want to say? No, the closing category wouldn't be, I don't think it's related to the use of all the time, but it would, but it would have a description. Yeah, I think it would describe it. Well, I think we can go over the call of the questions for later. Uh, let's take um, uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. 